Let's go to Psalm number 15 this morning. Psalm number 15. Are you there? Say amen. amen. All right. Good, good, good. I like to hear those amens. Psalm 15. Before we read this psalm, I wonder, has this ever happened to you? Because it has to me. Have you ever been a guest in somebody's home? Maybe you were staying with them or maybe you were just going for supper. But have you ever been a guest in somebody's home and felt real uncomfortable? Boy, that's a terrible feeling, isn't it? It's a terrible feeling when, you, when you're a guest and you just feel uncomfortable. Can I share this with you or ask you this? Have you ever been in the presence of another person that you should feel comfortable with, but because of your own actions, you feel very awkward? Has that ever happened to you? Give you an illustration. Sometimes if my kids have done wrong, they will act weird in my presence. (laughs) Now, they should feel very comfortable in my presence. We have a great relationship. We laugh a lot. We have fun. But if they're acting nervous and they won't look me in the eye and they're kind of avoiding me, as a dad, I can tell something's wrong. And so I look at him and say, okay, what'd you do? <laughs> what did you do? Come on, come out with it. Let's go. Let's clear the air here. You know, and, and I think that sometimes we tend to be that way with our Heavenly Father. I think that sometimes we don't feel comfortable in God's presence. Now, the truth is, if you're saved today, you have God's presence living and dwelling inside of you every moment of every day. But when we make a conscious move to talk to Him, to communicate with God, I think sometimes we feel very, very uncomfortable. Now, please understand me this morning. We do not have to earn the right to pray to God and enter into His presence. If you are saved today, the Lord Jesus Christ has provided you unfailing access to God, our Heavenly Father. The Bible teaches here in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18 that through Christ we have access by one spirit unto who? Who do I have access to? The Father. And it's through Christ. Look at the next verse, Ephesians chapter 3. It says, uh, in Christ we have boldness and we have access with confidence. With confidence by the faith of Him. Through the faith and the, f- the fidelity and the faithfulness of Christ, I have this boldness and this access. And, and so, Christ has given us unfailing access to the Father. Now, you know, it's, it's kind of like going back to my boys, my three sons. My boys have total access to me. They don't have to ask permission to talk to me. They don't have to uh, earn the right to be able to talk to me, to their dad, their father. Why? Well, because they're my sons. We have a relationship. They have total access to me. But whether or not they feel comfortable in my presence and whether or not they use the access that they have is, in fact, Another issue. Now in Psalm 15 and verse 1, look at it with me. The psalmist David writes, he asks two questions. Lord, he addresses the Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle and who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Now when he talks about God's tabernacle, that means God's dwelling place. When he talks about the holy hill, he's referring to God's presence, the place where God dwells. And he says, Lord, who is it that abides or dwells in your presence? The idea of abiding and dwelling is the idea of residing and permanently staying. So what he's basically saying is, now listen, he's saying, who is the person that's going to dwell in your presence? Who is the person that's going to, as a teenager would say, hang out with you? Who's the person that's going to dwell with you, God? Who's the person that's going to spend time with you? And then the rest of the psalm, he answers the question. Now, many of the principles that he's going to share and bring out are directly tied to Israel's Old Testament law system. Why? Because I've taught you the psalms were written under the Old Testament law system. And that was a time period, the Old Testament, when people didn't have complete unfailing access to God. Like we do today, because of the cross work of Christ because Christ has torn the veil that leads into God's presence through His cross work, but they didn't have that, see? And so we're not under the Old Testament law system, but 
I think there are some vital principles that we can derive from this psalm. That if we will apply these things to our lives, will help us to feel more comfortable in God's presence. To use the access that we have to talk to God. In other words, uh, if we will apply these principles to our life... I think that we'll find ourselves wanting to talk to God more, wanting to commune with God more. So what are the principles? How can I feel comfortable staying, abiding, being with God, talking with Him? How can I feel comfortable in my prayer life with that? Number one is this, the first principle is by living a righteous life. By living a righteous life. If you look down here at verse 2... He answers the question, okay, who is it that abides in God's presence? Verse 2, he that walketh, and what's that next word? Uprightly. And worketh, what? Righteous. Now look up here. Does God declare me righteous in his sight? Does he declare me righteous based on my goodness and my good works? Yes or no? No, I am declared eternally righteous the moment that I trust Jesus Christ to save me. The moment I trust Jesus, God takes the righteousness of Christ and the Bible uses a great word. He imputes it. He totally puts that on my account, Christ's righteousness. And and the righteousness that's given to me when I trust in Christ, that gives me the total access I was talking about to pray to the Father, to enter into His presence and and, and to lay my request at His feet. But now, wait a minute. Here's the reality. Here's the reality. If you're living in sin and rebellion and you're living in defiance of God's principles of righteousness, you are not going to desire to pray. Now, that's the reality of it. Even though it says in your handout that God loves you with an unconditional love, your sin will take away the sweet fellowship that you could enjoy with your Heavenly Father. Now, that's the reality of it. Now, I love my kids unconditionally, and they know that. My three sons know that... And every time I say my three sons, you guys get images of Fred McMurray, don't you? I know, you, I know that's what's going on. Some of you younger people are like, huh? But some of you older folks understand that, right? But every time... My, listen, my kids know that I love them unconditionally. But, now listen closely. If they are continually defying me, if they are continually disobeying my commands and what I ask them to do, or if they're continually disregarding what mom tells them to do, can I put it real nice, it's going to hinder our fellowship. Are you with me, parents? Now, I love them unconditionally. They got access to talk to me, but it's going to hinder that sweet fellowship that we could have if they're continually defying what I ask them to do. Now, let's go back to our relationship with God. Are we saved by our works of righteousness? Yes or no? No. The Bible says in Titus 3, 5, I'm not saved by works of righteousness, but by His mercy He saved us. But wait a minute. Do I have to... Now, now, now listen to the question. Do I have to earn the right to enter into the Lord's presence and, and, and talk to Him? Do I have to earn that through my righteous works? Yes or no? If you were listening earlier, you know that the case is no. Christ gives me access. And that the righteousness that's been given to me in Christ, that gives me unfailing access. And many people got this all twisted in their mind. They think, well, if I do enough right things today, then God's going to really let me talk to Him. If I can just do enough good things, if I can just... Live righteously enough, God's really going to hear me, and God is really going to give me what I want in prayer. You need to get that concept out of your mind. Because the Bible teaches in in Romans 5, 2, my access to the Lord is not rooted in my righteous works. My access to the Lord is rooted in the grace of God Almighty. Are you with me this morning? But has God given us righteous precepts to live by today? Is there righteous commands that God's given us? Yes or no? Yes, look at the screen. 1 Corinthians 15, 34 says, Awake to righteousness and sin not, 
For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Look at the next verse. He said, For ye know what commandments, Paul said, we gave you, the church, by the Lord Jesus. So are there righteous precepts for me today to live by? Are there commandments that God expects me to obey? Yes or no? Yes. Are they for my bad or for my good? They're for my good. And, and so what has God done? God has saved me by His grace, and then through His grace, God set me free, not to just live independently and do whatever I want to do. No, the grace of God has set me free to live righteously. The grace of God has set me free, your handout says, to live righteously. It set me free from sin. The grace of God has set me free, the Bible says in Titus 2.11. The grace of God teaches me to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, and to live righteously, godly in this present world. Now look up here and listen to me. And I, want to, I want to drive home the first point and move on. <clears throat> and I want to make sure we get this. This is, this is some vital teaching. Vital. Now if you've been listening this morning, you should know the answers to these questions. Number one, as a Christian, as a believer, as one who has trusted Christ and had His righteousness imputed to me, Do I have access, unfailing access, to the Father in prayer? Yes. Yes. Do I have access based on my works, yes or no? No, No, I'm not saved by my works, and I don't get access to God in prayer by my works. Does God hear me today because I was good? No. No. He hears me because of who? Jesus Christ. But, But let me ask you this. When I sin and I continually disobey and rebel against God's principles, do you think I'm going to want to pray? Do you think I'm going to feel comfortable in God's presence? Just like my kids want. My kids have access, but they're going to feel uncomfortable in my presence if their actions are continually against what I say. So I want you to get that first principle. Because if you feel like your prayer life is struggling, go back to this principle. Okay, who abides in God's presence, the psalmist says. The person that lives uprightly and works righteousness. That's the person that's obeying God and doing the the, the things that God has given us in His Word. That's the person that feels comfortable in the presence of God. But then there's a second principle. And I want you to look at Psalm 15, verse 2. Again, let's go back to verse 2. He answers the question, Lord, who is it? that abides in your presence? Who is it that, that's going that's to spend time with you, the Lord? He that walk, walketh uprightly uh, and worketh righteousness. And what's the next principle? And speaketh the what in his heart? Truth. I want you to get this statement in your handout. Number two, I feel comfortable in the presence of God when I'm keeping an honest heart. When I am keeping an honest heart. The person that abides in God's presence is the person who speaks the truth in his heart. You see, my friend, listen to me this morning. If you're in the balcony, stay with me now. Listen to me. God sees beyond your words, and he sees straight to your heart. Your heart lays open before God like an open book. I can't see your heart. I cannot see what you have thought since you have been in this building this morning. I cannot see your heart, you cannot see my heart, but I can promise you God sees our hearts. He knows everything you've thought since you've walked in the building. He knows every thought that you've had since you woke up. He knows the last thought you had before you went to bed last night. God sees our heart. And the Bible teaches, in your handout it says, God desires that your entire inner man be established in truth. God is a lover of truth. I want you to look in your handout with me. John 4, verse 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and what? In truth. I want you to look at the PowerPoint screen, please. First John 1, 6. John says, if we say that we have fellowship with Him, with God, with Christ, and we're walking in darkness, 
We lie and do not the truth. What's he saying? If you are living and doing things that pertain to the darkness, and yet you say, I'm in sweet fellowship with God. Man, me and God, we're tight. Me and God, man, I tell you, we're just in some, we're having some great fellowship. And you say, and you're walking in darkness. John says, you're lying and you're not being truthful. And you cannot grow in your relationship with the Lord if you are not truthful. The the Apostle Paul said this. He said in Ephesians 4.15, Speak the truth in love that you may grow up into Him in all things. The Apostle Paul said that your spiritual growth is directly tied to this issue of truth. So what's the principle? In your handout it says, Be honest with God about your life and what's going on in your heart. Because if you're living a lie, you will not desire God's fellowship and God's company. Let me say that again. If you're living a lie, you're not going to want God's fellowship and you're not going to want God's company. So what's the principle? You say, what do I do? Pastor Dan, sometimes I do do wrong. Sometimes I do do things that are, that are dishonest and that are not right. So what do I do? When you do wrong, you know what the best thing I have found in life when you do wrong? Admit it. Just admit it. Don't try and cover it. Don't try to make excuses. Don't try to act like it's not there or it's not a big deal. It's not an issue. Be truthful. Be honest. Because if you're not honest about it, The Bible teaches you give place to the devil in your life. The the, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, Take the whole armor of God upon you, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And do you know what the first piece of armor God lists? He says, have your loins girt about with truth. Truth. I, I cannot stand against the wiles of the devil if I'm not girt about with truth. So what do I do? I keep an honest heart. If I'm wrong, I admit I'm wrong. I just say, man, I was wrong. I just stand up like a man or a woman. And I just stand up and say, I was wrong. Period. And, and, and we, we, we don't try to hide it and sweep it under the rug or act like it, you know, it's nothing. No, no, no. We're honest about it. We're honest about it with ourselves. We're honest about it with God. Listen, many times I've just had to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I messed up. You ever do that? I messed up. Lord, I'm not living according to the identity you've given me in Christ. I'm not living according to a child of light, which you've made me in your son. And, and Lord, I'm doing things that pertain to the darkness. And, and Lord, it's just not right. Thank you that you're the blood that Jesus shed. Thank you that you've saved me and you've forgiven me. Thank you, I have forgiveness in Christ. Now, Lord, I want to start living according to who you've made me in Christ. That's just being honest. That's just keeping an honest heart, see, before the Lord. And and if you're not honest, you're not going to want to pray. That's the point. You're not going to feel comfortable in the presence of God if you don't keep an honest heart. And then the third principle is this. Let's move right along here. And, And how can I feel comfortable in the presence of God? Number three, by maintaining a right relationship with others. By maintaining a right relationship with others. That's what verse 3 in this psalm is all about. It's, and we're going to read it here in a moment. But before we do, let me make this statement. When your earthly human relationships are out of sorts, teenagers with your parents, okay, husbands with your wives, with your coworkers. When when your earthly human relationships are out of sorts, and, and you haven't done everything possible to try to bring re- sometimes you try to bring resolution and the other person just won't let you bring resolution. They won't let you make peace. But if you but if you haven't even tried to make peace, you haven't even tried to resolve the thing, and you've just got this animosity in your heart, it's going to hinder it's My horizontal relationships affect my vertical relationship with the Lord. And in your handout, it says that unresolved conflict with others will hinder your fellowship with God. Unresolved conflict 
will hinder your fellowship with God. This is taught throughout the Bible. Different dispensations. Okay? Um, for instance, Jesus taught that principle to Israel in Matthew 5. You know what he said? I'll summarize it. Jesus said, if you're going to, Israel, if you're going to the altar to make an offering to God, and you remember your brother has ought against you, leave your gift, leave the offering there at the altar, go and make things right with your brother, then come back and make your offering to the Lord. Unresolved conflict. Jesus said, Don't, you're not going to be able to worship effectively until you get that result. Uh, John and and, and Peter taught that principle. Peter talked about husbands and wives not being in unity and their prayers being hindered. Um, John said, you know, if if you say you love God but you hate your brother, how is it that you can love God who you haven't seen but you can't love your brother who you have seen? And, And so John taught that principle. But you know who else taught it? Our apostle, the apostle Paul, the apostle to the body of Christ, the church. In your handout... It says there that uh, Paul warned that unresolved conflict gives place to the devil. I, I want to bring up on the screen Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. If you would, look at the screen. Paul said to the church, Be ye angry and sin not. So there is a form of anger that's not sinful. I mean, if I'm angry at sin, or I'm just angry at a bad situation, I'm angry at, uh, at the devil, you know, that's okay. He said, be ye angry and sin not. So there's a, there's a righteous anger, there's an unrighteous anger. Here, here he says, though, wait a minute, though. Let not the sun go down upon your what? Yes. Wrath. And then look what the very next phrase is. When I go to bed with unresolved anger. When, and I've heard of couples that have made a commitment to each other. They won't go to bed angry. If it means staying up till 3 o'clock in the morning, we will get it resolved before we go to sleep. And they base it on this verse. I think it's a good thing to to go by. But he says, let not the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, don't carry unresolved anger and bitterness and animosity in your heart. Why? Well, what's the next verse say? What happens when I do that? I give what? That word place means room. I give room to the devil. I give him space. I give him room to work in my life. When I have unresolved anger and unresolved bitterness and hatred. Same thing he taught in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll bring it up on the screen. A young man had sinned in the church. And many of the people had brought discipline to this young man. And he said to the church, To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. If I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the presence of Christ. Look at this. Why, why was he teaching this principle of forgiveness? Lest Satan should get a what? An advantage of us. For we're not ignorant of his devices. Unforgiveness is one of Satan's devices. Bitterness is one of his things. It's not God's. Bitterness and anger and animosity and hatred. Those are all the devil's tools. They're not God's. And he said, you know what? You give Satan an advantage. You give him room to work in your life when you let those things Live in your heart. So back to Psalm. There are three ways that I can hurt my relationship with other people, according to Psalm 15.3. These things in Psalm 15.3 will will damage my relationship with others. Okay? So who is it that's going to hang out in God's presence? He says, it's he that backbiteth not with his tongue. Do you all know what that means, to backbite? Backbite. I think you get the meaning. Have you ever heard this expression? Hey, what are you doing talking behind my... Yeah. You ever heard this one? You better watch out because he's going to stab you in the... Backbiting. Back... That's when you gossip. That's another word for gossip. That's when you won't deal with something face to face with somebody you're just going to talk about them you're not going to you're not going to confront it you're not going to talk you're not going to talk to them you're just going to talk behind their back you're just going to think bad of them you're just going to do this you're just going to stab them in the back you're just going to talk behind their back and he said you hinder your relationship with people when you do that backbiting listen christian you should never be a backbiter at work you should never be a backbiter to your boss you got something to say say it to him But don't backbite behind his back. 
You know, if you've got something to say to your spouse, say it to them. But don't go, ladies, and talk to the other ladies about your husband. Sure is quiet in here. You guys are scaring me a little. If you got something to say, guys, man, say it to your wife, but don't go over here and talk to the guys at the gym about it. You know, I mean, here's the deal. Uh, you know, it, it, it takes some courage to talk to somebody face-to-face, but that's the right thing to do. Don't backbite. Don't backbite. Don't just talk about people behind their back. That hurts your relationship with people, and what happens is then you don't want to hang out in God's presence. You don't want to spend time with God. Because you're not right with others. The second thing he says there, look at verse 3. He that bagbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor. Did you know there's never an excuse for a Christian to do evil to his neighbor? Did you know the apostle Paul said, If thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. He said, you know what? You don't overcome evil with evil. He said, you overcome evil with what? With good. You overcome evil with good. There's never an excuse for you to do evil to your neighbor. There's never an excuse for you to backbite against your neighbor. And then the third thing is this. He said, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. And the idea there is that you are just trying to make this person look bad in front of other people. You're just trying to shame them. You're just trying to make them look bad in front of as many people as you can. You just want to reproach them. Unresolved conflict with others will greatly ill affect your fellowship with Christ. And you don't need that in your life. So if you've got unresolved conflict, get it right today. Because it'll feel like a dark cloud's been lifted off of you. But as long as it's there, as long as you keep that that bitterness, that anger, that hatred, as long as you backbite, as long as you're not right with other people, it's going to negatively impact your relationship with God. Because you're not going to feel like talking to God when you're not right with your neighbor. And then the last principle is this. How can I feel comfortable in God's presence? Number four, by living a life of integrity. What does the word integrity mean? Well, it carries the idea of wholeness and soundness. For example, um, we may say uh, a lawyer is giving a case, and somebody may say, well, boy, there's a lot of cracks in their testimony. What does that mean? When it says, we say there's a lot of cracks, what they're saying is it lacks integrity, that, that it doesn't, there's not a soundness and wholeness to their testimony. Um, give you another illustration. Somebody may say, don't go in that building. Why not? Because the roof lacks integrity. What are we saying? We're saying that that roof, there's cracks, there's, there's things that make it to where it's not sound, it's not whole. In your handout is a great definition I gave you of integrity for a Christian. Integrity for a Christian could be defined as a one-to-one correlation between my Bible, my beliefs, and my behavior. In other words, I say I believe this. And, and so if my beliefs come from this, then my behavior should match my beliefs. So now there's a one-to-one correlation between my Bible, what I say I believe, and the way I behave. That is integrity. It's a sound wholeness where your walk matches your what? Your talk. And it's grounded on the belief system of your life. And and integrity carries the idea of, of, of being complete, being undivided. The opposite of integrity. Does anybody want to take a guess? What would you say if integrity is a sound wholeness where, where my, my, my Bible, my beliefs, and my behavior match, what, what do you think a word would be for the opposite of integrity? Unsound. Unsound. Okay, what's another word? I got two-faced. Okay, all right. I, how about this word? Hypocrisy. The opposite of a life of integrity would be a life of Hypocrisy. I say one thing, but I do another. And in verses 4 and 5, we have a picture of a man of integrity. It says, In whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not, he that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. 
Can I give you four things real quickly from those two verses? It's in your handout. A person of integrity, number one, reproves the vile person. They have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove it. Number two, a person of integrity respects the godly person. Nobody else may respect them, but the man of integrity respects the godly person. Oh, the world may mock, the world may make fun, but a person of integrity respects the godly person. Number three, a person of integrity remembers his promises. He says that he, he sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. Do you know what that means? That means that when I make a promise, even if it costs me something, I keep my word. I swear to my own hurt. In other words, I make a promise, but it ends up to my own hurt, but that's okay, I change not. I don't go back on my word just because if I made a promise and then I realize that promise is going to cost me something, I don't change. I go ahead and keep my promise that I made, even if it costs me something. That's integrity. And then the fourth thing right here is that a person of integrity refuses to be driven by money. It said they, they don't put out their money to usury, interest, nor do they take reward against the innocent. The honest person has to make a living. We all do. We've all, we've all got bills to pay. Amen? But, but you know what? The honest person makes a living but does it honestly. Does it uprightly. They don't make a living over here by taking advantage of other people. They don't make a living by taking advantage of others. That's a man of integrity. That's a woman of integrity. And when our life... Listen to me. I'm almost done. When our life lacks integrity, can I tell you what happens? We are not comfortable in the presence of God. Have you ever felt like a hypocrite? It's okay to admit it. I have. Oh, man, I have. And you know what I found out? When, well, listen, when you feel like a hypocrite, does that make you want to spend time with God? No. No, we avoid God's fellowship when our life is one of hypocrisy. And David ends this psalm. Look how he ends it. Verse, six, verse 5. He that doeth these things shall never be what? Do you know what he's saying? Look, look up at me here. The person that practices these principles in this psalm, listen, they can tarry in God's presence in prayer and feel completely comfortable and just enjoy the sweet fellowship of God. They can just, they can just be with the Lord, spend time with Him, and just be completely comfortable with it. Why? Because these principles are intact in their life. You know, I've, I've told my kids, kids, if you obey and you do what's right, you know what? We're going to have fun. We're going to laugh. We're going to play. We're going to have a good time. We're going to enjoy each other. But when you choose to disobey, when you choose to do what you know is wrong, it's going to hinder that, that sweet, fellowship we could have in our home. And it's the same thing in our relationship with the Lord. When we're, when we're living by God's righteous principles and, we're, we're, and when we don't, we admit it. You know, in other words, we have an honest heart. And, and when we're right this way with each other and we're, we're living a life of integrity, we're not just out here living a life of hypocrisy, we want to spend time with God. We feel comfortable in the presence of God. And I'm convinced that the greatest privilege that the Christian has is prayer. Let me say that again. The greatest privilege that you have, Christian, is prayer. But I'm also convinced that it's probably the thing that most Christians do the least of. It's a struggle. And it really goes back to some of these things right here. We do things that hinder our fellowship with the Lord. Not our relationship, 
That's through Christ. He loves us unconditionally. And that, that won't change. But that sweet fellowship, we hinder it ourselves. You know, I heard an expression one time. It said, if, if you don't feel as close to God as you once did, guess who moved? <laughs> it wasn't God. He said, the person that does these things shall never be moved. He didn't say God would move. He didn't say that when you do these things, God's going to move away from you. No, no, no. It's you move yourself away from, from that fellowship that you could have. So let's, let's take and use that, that great privilege that we have of prayer. And let's take this message home and let's apply these principles. Let's do, let's do some heart surgery and let's really apply these principles to our lives. All right, let's pray this morning.